Since 1992, DW Fern mic preamps, equalizers, and compressors have been used in some of the world's best studios and in private use in home studios around the world. This tutorial will help you get the most from your DW Fern products, learn what each control does, and see the best setup starting points for a variety of recording situations. Learn how to interface our products with the rest of your studio gear. Take a peek inside and see how our products are made and learn from Doug Fern's experience in over 40 years in pro audio. The VT2 is a two-channel microphone preamplifier which uses all Class A triode vacuum tubes in the audio path. It has two completely independent channels which can be used separately on two totally different so sounds or, of course, it could be used together as a stereo pair. We're going to talk about why two preamplifiers sound different than solid state preamplifiers and we'll talk about how to adjust your VT2 to get the most out of it under a variety of circumstances and explain what all the controls do and we'll take a look inside to see how it's built. The VT2 came about because when I first started recording in the 1960s all I had were tube gear. Solid state recording equipment existed, but it was very expensive and, and uh, for me just starting out, it was out of my range. So the microphone preamplifiers that I used were all tube. Majority of them were made by RCA and they ranged from 1930s vintage up to the late 50s. And I had a whole rack full of them and a passive mixer and that all went into um, tube type Ampex tape machines and so on. I couldn't wait to get a real console, you know, a solid state console that had m many more inputs, it had um, slide faders, it had equalizers on every channel, it had all this facilities that, that weren't available in, in the homemade tube mixer that I had built for recording. So finally in the late 60s I was able to get a solid state console, waited about a year for it to be built, and it was beautiful and it had all these features on it. It seemed terrific. The problem was when we first hooked it up and started using it, we discovered immediately that it didn't sound the same at all. And to my ear, it didn't sound nearly as good as what I had been using prior to that. And that was a little disturbing, especially after spending all that money to buy this fancy console. But I thought, and a lot of other people at that time thought, well, we've just been listening to tubes for so long we had to get used to this new solid state equipment. We just weren't used to the, the perfection of, of solid state. We were just still back with this ancient technology of vacuum tubes. But for some of us, we never really forgot the sound of the tube preamps. I got rid of all mine soon after I got that console, but eventually I got a couple more uh, to, to replace the ones that I had given away or thrown away or whatever happened to them because there were times when I just knew that a solid state preamp just couldn't handle certain sounds the same way as a tube mic preamp could. And after delving into it and doing some research and particularly being influenced by some wonderful research done by Russ Hamm that was published in the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society in, in the early 1970s, discovered exactly what it was that made tubes sound different from solid state. And in its most simplistic form, the difference has to do with the overload characteristics and the harmonics that are generated from that overload. One of the things in Russ Ham's article, which was eye-opening to me, and I repeated this because I just had to prove it to myself it was true, was the extreme high output level of many microphones with certain types of sounds. You could take something like an old ribbon microphone, like an RCA 44, and put that on a piano and measure incredibly high output levels on the original transient peaks when the notes were hit. And this was, was amazing. I mean, it was a good 20 dB higher than the average level that we're reading on a VU meter, even taking into account that normally recording piano on tape, you kept the level down a bit. On other kinds of material and other kinds of microphones, the, the difference was even more extraordinary. A condenser microphone put on a drum set, for example, 
could show output levels that were measured in volts. This was far higher than what a, a preamp could take without distortion. However, it didn't sound that bad because the duration of the um, transient peak was very short, measured in milliseconds. So you didn't perceive it as distortion. What you perceived it as was a smearing of that initial transient attack. It just didn't have the sharp sharpness and clarity that the original sound had. And this is caused by the fact that those very high peaks will go into distortion, whether it's in a solid state mic preamp or in a tube mic preamp. In the case of a solid state amplifier, most cases, when it goes into distortion, it just gets to a certain point where it can no longer uh, reproduce the waveform and it becomes uh, clipped, becomes essentially a square wave. And uh, the, a square wave is not a pleasant sound to listen to. It's, it's very raucous and, and ugly sounding. And that extreme transient peak wasn't perceived as distortion, but just as just something not quite right with the attack of the instrument. You could theoretically bring the level down low enough by moving the mic back, using pads in the mic line, pads on the mic preamp, whatever, to get the range down to where the preamp wasn't clipping. But at that point, you were way down on level and way down into the noise. Now, in vacuum tube microphone preamplifiers, they suffer from the same problem. The peak levels are just way too high. Um, but the difference is with tube circuitry, particularly with triodes, when they go into distortion, they don't generate that clipped waveform, that square wave that you get with solid state. What happens is the distortion products tend to be mostly even order harmonics. What that means is that if the initial sound, say of a piano, uh, hitting an A440, the predominant harmonic that would be imposed on that during that transient peak would be one octave higher at 880. It would be just as if you hit that next higher A key very, very softly along with the, the original key. And when you do that, it adds fullness and body to the sound. It's musical. In fact, most musical instruments rely on the fact that our hearing prefers even order harmonics. Instruments that sound rich and full are loaded with all those overtones and they're dominated by those even order harmonics. The odd harmonics tend to sound discordant to us. To our ear, they don't sound right. If you take the third harmonic of that 440, it doesn't really fall on any musical note. It doesn't fall on any note that fits into the key of the music. So it doesn't blend in, it just sounds bad. Taken to an extreme, it's very ugly and unlistenable, but even on, at low levels, it adds this degree of, um, of, of unpleasant sound to, to the original note that, that, that our hearing finds uh, unpleasant. So that's one of the main reasons why tube microphone preamplifiers tend to sound better than their solid state equivalents. That doesn't mean that solid state mic preamps can't sound good. If they're designed properly and used properly, they can sound really, really nice. But with a tube preamp, you, you have some of that distortion going on all the time. In a well-designed circuit, it's under very good control, so you don't hear it uh, very obviously. But when you compare it to a solid state device, what you're hearing now is that uh, even order harmonic distortion which is absent in the solid state design. Um, and what distortion there is in the solid state tends to have that discordant odd order harmonic sound to it. So that's one of the reasons why there's a difference in sound. And when I was doing my own recording uh, back in the 1980s, doing mostly location recording of classical music and choral music, I built myself a, a mixer uh, with solid state mic preamps and I did a lot of research on preamp design and came up with some mic preamps that measured very, very well and um, actually sounded pretty good. But there was something about the sound that I just found was lacking, it was missing. And I, I noticed that when, when I was a studio owner as well. And that's those are the cases where we would use the tube mic preamps or some other piece of tube gear in the audio chain to, to try and recover some of that warmth and musicality. 
So I thought, well, maybe I'll build a, a vacuum tube mic preamp for my own use. And I thought, wow, can I even get these parts? I mean, is, is anything still available that you could use to build vacuum tube circuitry? And fortunately, it was. So I was able to build some tube mic preamps, and I thought they sounded remarkably good. And um, I thought, wow, if I like this, maybe there's other people out there that will like this sound too. And that was the origin of the VT1 microphone preamplifier, which we still make, which is a single channel version, exact same circuit here as the VT2. They're both exactly the same. It's just the VT2 has two channels and the VT1 has one channel. So everything we talk about today with the VT2 applies equally to the VT1. If we look at the front panel of the VT2, you can see there's quite a few controls. It's not just a simple thing where you plug your microphone in one end and take the line level signal out the other. There's a lot you can do with the signal along the way. The control that you probably use most on the VT2 is what we label attenuation. This is a control that actually adjusts the overall gain of the VT2. So we don't call it gain because technically it's not really changing the gain of the amplifier, but uh, attenuation more accurately describes its function. But you could think of it as varying the gain of the microphone preamplifier. Now to monitor the level of the signal going through the VT2 or VT1, we have a VU meter, one for each channel. These VU meters are true VU meters. They show uh, an accurate representation of volume, not peak level. It's a standard which has been in effect for many, many years and is used to make a corresponding visual representation of the volume of a sound. And it gives us a very good indication of where we are in the range of the, uh, of the VT2 between being too low and being too high. Now there are occasions when you might want to run the VT2 higher than a normal level, you might want to purposely overdrive it to uh, emphasize those even order harmonics. And in order to do that, you'd have to turn the level up higher, and this would cause the VU meter to be pinning. Now this is a $100 VU meter, so this isn't something you want to destroy on a routine basis because it's expensive to replace. So we put a switch on the meter which allows you to turn the meter off if you're using it in such a way that you don't want to damage the meter. Most of the time it'll be on, but if you need to, you can always turn it off. 